To deny yourself means to let go of anything that is pulling you away from Jesus Christ or from pulling you away from what Jesus desires for you to do. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 24 through 28. And we hear the words of Jesus as he is talking to not only his own disciples, but to those who are gathered around to hear his teaching. I invite you to hear these words. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then He will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. The Word of God for us, the people of God. Let us pray. <laughs> Loving, gracious God, we ask today that you would give us humble, teachable, and trusting hearts that we may receive what you are to tell us today and that we are freed by your grace and power to do as you have commanded us to do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Growing up in the 1980s, like, like I did, there were many different heroes in popular culture, and one of those was Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. Some of you may remember those movies with Harrison Ford. There is a, a, a scene that always stuck with me uh, at the end of the third Indiana Jones movie. It's uh, called uh, The Last Crusade, and it has to do with the Holy Grail, which you know, this is imaginary, but it was the idea that there was a cup, the chalice that Jesus used at the Last Supper that somehow survived and it was handed down and it had these sort of miraculous powers that if you drank from it, you would never die. So they were looking for it and they finally found it in this cave in a church uh, in the middle of nowhere in the desert. And they were together there with the cup and there was this rule that if you took the cup past a certain part of the church there in the middle of the desert, something bad would happen. Well, Indiana Jones was caring about saving his father, and he did, but there was another person with him. Her name was Elsa, and she was drunk with power. She was drunk with greed. She was looking at the cup from the Last Supper as this prize to be won instead of this sacred Thing that you should be careful with. And so she takes the cup and is trying to get out of the church and then she passes the seal and everything starts to go bad. There's earthquake. This giant canyon opens up below their feet and she ends up falling into the canyon. But Indiana Jones, of course, the hero, grabs her hand and is holding on to her with one hand but with her other hand, she sees the cup there on a ledge. And she reaches out to it. She reaches out to it. She can almost grasp it. She kind of touches it with her finger. And then Indiana Jones starts saying to her, your hand is slipping. Give me your other hand. And she just says, I can reach it. And all of a sudden, her hand slips and she falls. There, there's this thing that she sees in front of her that she desires, that she thinks will make her life better, that will be a prize, that will make her name known, and she cannot let go of that, and it ends up costing her her life. There's this, this image of, of her being sort of caught between two things, right? Her desire for what she wants and her life. Now, hopefully most of us would have the clarity of thought to give Indiana Jones our other hand, right? If it comes down to our lives, 
But in some way, I think this metaphor works for other things in our lives that may not be as clear. In some ways, we cannot let go of things that are pulling us away from life itself, or at least the life that God has for us. Some of us cannot seem to let go of the past. We allow the past to define us, to to really imprison us. For some people, they can't let go of anger. Again, they let anger imprison them. Some people cannot let go of their phones or their screens. They just are glued to them. Some people can't let go to old clothes. My, my wife, Julie, has a relative who has these pair of shorts that are really too short for this male relative. You know, they were from the, a long time ago. They're really too short, and there are holes in them. And finally, somebody had the courage to say to her relative, you know, what about your, your shorts? They're kind of getting old. And he said, my, my new shorts? No, I've only had those for 15 years. They're still good. (laughs) Sometimes we hold on to things for too long. Way too long. You know, I wonder why we do this. I wonder why we hold on. Is it possible that we hold on because we have these deep, intimate, sentimental attachments to people or things? Or ideas? Is it possible that, that at the same time we have a fear of change and by getting, letting go of these things we know that change is inevitable and we just don't want it to happen and so we hold on with a tight grip? Psychologists tell us that sometimes we don't let go because we don't know how to let go. It might be easy for someone to say just let go of that but they don't know how to mentally, emotionally let go of the thing that they're holding on to. The good news for us, friends, is that if we can learn to let go of the things that imprison us, of the things that bind us to where we are instead of where we need to go, if we can learn to let go of these things, there is a future for us. We can move on to what is next. We can no longer be imprisoned or bound to the thing that we just can't bring ourselves to let go of. Jesus was in the business of inviting people into a new life. We see this time and time again as he's teaching and preaching. He's always asking the people uh, in uh, Israel, but also people from outside of Israel, to invite them to say that they're freed from the past, they're freed from the old ways of doing things and invited to a new way of doing things, to see God in a new way, to understand their own relationship to God in a new way. But there were many that he encountered who would not say yes to his offer. They could not free themselves from the things that they were holding on to. Or maybe they were just afraid of the change or insecurity that might come with his invitation. If you follow along with the Life Track daily readings, you may remember that yesterday we heard uh, a story about Jesus encountering someone and inviting them to follow him, but they just could not do it. In Matthew uh, chapter 8, we hear these words. A scribe then approached Jesus and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And it continues. It says, Another of his disciples, now this is not one of the twelve, but another disciple, uh, said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. So someone who is already sort of following Jesus says to him, I want to follow you, but first let me go bury my father. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their their own dead. Now, we read this passage and it becomes very troubling, right? Can't Jesus allow this person to go to his father's funeral? Billy Graham has a way of explaining this passage that I think is very helpful. He says that during the time of Jesus, during that time and place, that culture 
was very much set up where the father of the house was in charge and everyone in that house had a duty to that father. Once that father passed away, then the sons were able to do as they pleased. And so Billy Graham says it's very likely that what this man was saying was, I love you, Jesus, I want to follow you, but my father is still living and I am under his household. Let me wait until my father dies and then I will follow you. That could be a year. That could be 10 years. And so that puts a little bit of a different spin on it, doesn't it? That Jesus was, was telling him, you don't have to follow through with those old duties. You can come with me now if you so choose. It's still difficult because we have those deep duties to our family, don't we? That sense that we owe the people who got us to where we are. And I think we do in some ways. But when it comes to following Jesus, he's expecting us to give us, to give him all of who we are. All of our time, all of our energy, everything. So when he was inviting that person to follow him, that disciple could not give everything. Maybe it was true that he felt this duty to his father. Maybe it was just an excuse, a polite way to say no to Jesus. We don't know. But Jesus invited him to be freed from whatever he was holding on to and to take that step. And he just couldn't. Essentially, what I want to say to you today is that what holds you from following Christ is what you were unwilling to let go of. What, you, what holds you back from following Christ is what you were unwilling to let go of. I remember uh, I told you before that when I uh, was um, a young man in college, I decided that I wanted to go into ministry. I decided that, that this was what God was calling me to do. But at the same time, I grew up in the Methodist church. I was a lifelong Methodist, and I knew that once you became a, an elder, once you became an ordained minister, then the bishop got to say, go here, go here, go here. And I lived in the same city, the same town, small town, where I knew most of the people from kindergarten through high school. And I didn't really think that that was going to be a very good lifestyle for me. So I was saying yes to God, but then I was holding on saying, but I'm not going to be a preacher. Because I don't want to move around. And so I decided in the back of my mind that I was going to be a pastoral counselor. You know, a therapist, a Christian therapist that would help people. Then I couldn't move around because my office would always be in the same place. But of course, life has a way and God has a way of changing things along the, your path. And of course, if I had held on to that idea that I couldn't move, I wouldn't be here with you starting my sixth year ministry here at Bluff Park. I love being here. I love being with you. And if I held on to that sense of control and security, instead of allowing myself to be free for God to send me where God wants me to be, I may not have ended up here. In today's reading, Jesus says that if we want to find our life, we have to lose it. And that seems like backwards thinking, doesn't it? We have to deny ourselves to pick up our cross and to follow him. To deny yourself does not mean to hate yourself. It does not mean to think that you are somehow vile. We are sinful. We need to be honest about that. But to, to deny yourself is to not say that you are worthless. To deny yourself means to let go of anything that is pulling you away from Jesus Christ or from pulling you away from what Jesus desires for you to do. There are things in our lives that, that become a roadblock, a stumbling block from our relationship with Jesus Christ. Those are the things that we need to let go of. If you look throughout the, the Bible, Romans chapter 6 through 8 or Ephesians 4, 
Even Galatians 5, you see this discussion going on in the Scripture, especially in the writings of Paul, where he's talking about this pull between what is good, what is holy, and what is worldly. What is, what is the things that become part of our selfish desire? And those are the things that we sometimes hold on to, those selfish desires. Sometimes those are obvious sins that prevent us from having a deeper, uh, deep relationship with Christ. But sometimes they are things that seem normal and seem fine, and yet they are holding us back. We are called to lose the parts of us that are not in harmony with Jesus Christ. We're called to lose the things in our lives that are not in harmony with who He is and what He calls us to do. We must let go of selfish desires, anger, and greed because Jesus displays selflessness, love, forgiveness, the things that we are called as Christians to do. We have to let go of our desire to be liked by other people because sometimes in order to achieve that, we have to allow ourselves to be less of who God calls us to be. And we have to learn to let go of our need for control, which is a form of pride, which I think is what I was dealing with as a young man, the sense of control that I wanted to prevent myself from getting into a situation where I did not know what would happen to me. What holds you back from following Christ is what you are unwilling to let go of. When we are unwilling to let go, we cannot follow Jesus Christ with all of our heart. For you today, you need to be thinking about what it is that you are unwilling to let go of. Again, some of these things are clear issues for you to work through. Sometimes it may be something that is less clear. Something that you are holding on to even though you know you're being pulled in two directions. One is towards the cross and one is towards the self. I've told you this several times, but I just think this image is so perfect for us understanding how we need to lose ourselves. St. Augustine uh, was an African bishop uh, back in the 4th century. And St. Augustine uh, said that we as human beings suffer from something called incurvatus in C, which in Latin means curved in upon yourself. And what he says is, is that sin, primarily pride, but Martin Luther used this to cover all sins. He says that sin is a way of turning our back upon God and turning in upon ourselves. Putting more attention on ourselves, our heart, our desires, than upon what God wants for us. In a way, we make our own self or our own desires an idol. So in curvatus in C, mean curved in upon ourselves, means that in my life, my sinfulness, my desire for control, my unwillingness to let go of anger or greed or whatever it is, is pulling me in like this, that I'm curved in upon myself. And what St. Augustine says is that when we are curved in upon ourselves like this, we cannot do the two things that God, through Jesus Christ, says are the most important commandments. To love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. If you think about your neighbor being outside of you, if you think about God being above you, if you are curved in upon yourself, you cannot look at your neighbor and you cannot look up to God. When we lose ourselves, when we deny ourselves, that is not a way of shaming ourselves or punishing ourselves. It's freeing ourselves. It feels like punishment. It feels like suffering to deny ourselves or to lose ourselves. And yet the good news that Jesus says, if we learn to lose ourselves, we're actually freeing ourselves to be who God created us to be and to do what God created us to do to love God and to love neighbor as ourselves. It does feel painful. We feel like we are giving too much. And yet what Jesus says is, when we lose our life, we will find it. If we want to find the life that God has for us, we must deny ourselves and to take up our own cross. That means 
that we have to be willing to let go of the things that hold us back from doing just that. My friends, I hope that you can find some way in your heart, in your life, to let go of the thing that has been holding you back the most. And if you ever want to talk to Angela or myself or any one of our pastors about how you can do that, we may not have the clearest answer, but we would love to help you on that journey. Let us pray. Holy and living God, we give you thanks for today and we ask that you would work within each of our hearts. That you would help us to to see more clearly what we are holding on to and how that prevents us from being all that you call us to be. From doing what you called us to do. And from having a more full and meaningful relationship with you and to live the life that you call us to live. Help us, O oh God, to learn to let go, that we might lose ourselves and find you and find life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.